Well, good morning. Okay, you may have noticed I'm not physically here, but I am digitally here, and most importantly, I'm here in spirit. I wasn't able to be uh, physically at Inland Hills today, but this is the last week of our series, Counter Counter Culture, and I did not want to miss it. So I will be back next week, and we're going to start a new series next week. So our, our series that we're starting next week is going to be called Best Sermon Ever, and it's going to be several weeks that we're going to be looking just kind of like verse by verse at the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, our idea here is that you really can't understand just how good Michael Jordan was if you never saw a video of him playing. And you can't understand how good Taylor Swift is at managing energy and getting a crowd all riled up if you've never sat in the audience. And you really can't understand just how world-changing and shaking the message of Jesus was if you've never studied his most important sermon. So for the next several weeks, starting next Sunday, we are going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthews chapter 5 through 7. I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll invite someone. It's a great a series to jump in to a deeper dive of what Jesus taught. It's also a great introductory way to learn about Jesus. If you have friends or family members who are interested in checking him out, but they're not sure what to think about him yet, we always welcome skeptics and people who are wrestling with questions and doubts here. It is a big part of what we do in the community. So that starts next Sunday. I'll be here in person. Looking forward to seeing you then. This week, we're going to wrap up the very last week of Counter Counterculture. A quick, uh, a quick just introduction of what we've talked about over the last several weeks. I'll be fast here. I would encourage you to catch up either on our website at inlandhills.com or on our YouTube channel if you haven't had an opportunity to because this series has built a lot over the last several weeks. Week one, we talked about culture and how culture is made, that culture is what we make of the world, that we're handed when we are children uh, a worldview. We're told who the heroes are. We are told uh, what the artifacts are in our culture that represent uh, the way that our culture thinks. And so it, like week one, we talked about that, and we talked about the fact that Jesus, in the first century, radically upended every part of culture for both the Jews and then after his death and resurrection, the Gentiles in first century Rome as well. So he changed their worldview, he changed their rituals, he changed their heroes, and he changed their artifacts. And so we really wanted to understand Jesus better as we walked through this series. So week two, we looked at his teachings. We, took it, we looked at five major te teachings of Jesus that were completely countercultural in the first century, and they're really countercultural now. To live like this, right, is, is not the way that most people would advise you to live. And yet, we believe, as followers of Christ, that it is the most beautiful way to live. And then the next week, we talked about the fact that, unfortunately, instead of being known for living in this way, Christians in the United States have largely, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, been known for being at war with the culture that we live in. And we just, we just named that Jesus didn't come to earth to recruit culture warriors. He didn't come to earth for us to try and insist that people who don't follow him try to live as if they did. <laughs> Rather, Jesus came to recruit disciples who will imitate his sacrificial love. This is always the way that the kingdom has gone forward. Then the next week, we talked about Christian nationalism, which is not something that is specific just to the United States. This is a problem that we've been dealing with since at least the fourth century. But the major problem for Christian nationalism is like defining a nation as Christian is simply that Christian nationalism ascribes to a nation what should only be ascribed to Jesus. When we start to see Rome, or America, or the UK, or Germany, in any country as being the hope of the world, we are ascribing to a nation what should only be ascribed to Jesus and his kingdom. That really is the problem. And then last week, uh, we simply looked at how we can be a people of peace in a culture of outrage. So we talked about having our identity firmly planted in who Jesus says we are. We talked about being seekers of the truth and not prone to partisan divide uh, where we automatically just jump on bandwagons or we side with our tribe that's most comfortable. And we talked, most importantly, about empathy, being able to understand other people, having the heart of Jesus as we approach other people, that everyone has infinite worth and we are to follow after his understanding of who they are in him. And we just said last week that Jesus didn't come just to ensure that we understand God. Like That is part of why he came, but it's not the only reason that he came. Rather, we talked about the fact that Jesus came so we would know that God understands us. 
So this is kind of a, a catch-up. This is what we've looked at over the last five weeks. And today we're going to just kind of tie that all together. Now, uh, if you've been following along, you'll know that we have talked about a lot of stuff that may be different than what we've talked, than what you've heard before. The reason we've called this series Counter, Counter Culture is because we believe that the way of Jesus is both counter to the culture that we live in here in the United States or in the West, but it is also counter to the religious culture that many of us either grew up with with, or that we were aware of. So the way of Jesus is counter to, yes, our secular culture, but it's also counter to the religious culture that many of us are familiar with. Which I know, to talk about this, like it's a reprogramming of the mind for some of us. We haven't thought about the way of Jesus in the way that we have laid it out in the scriptures that we've looked at, the passages that we've explored over the last several weeks. And so this is difficult. And especially if you're older, if you're like my age or older, Older, then kind of rewiring your brain around what it looks like to follow after Jesus can be really, really challenging. You know, one of the most important demographics in advertising is younger people, that like 18 to 30-ish demographic, especially 18 to 24. It's a really important demographic for advertisers because here's what advertisers know. If they can get your mind, if they can hook you early on in life, then you are more likely to stick with that product the older that you get. And so, like, the, I mean, I am living evidence of this, by the way. Like, for instance, when I was in eighth grade, uh, my favorite basketball player in the world uh, played for the Orlando Magic. His name was Penny Hardaway. And, man, th- this guy, I thought he was going to be the next Michael Jordan. He had all the talent that he needed to to probably be one of the greatest players to ever play in the NBA. But he blew both of his knees out and just had major issues over the next several seasons. But he had a shoe line and the Air Pennies. And I, I loved, like, my parents up to this point hadn't, they had bought us shoes, like good shoes to play basketball in, but never had like the, the nicest kind of top end shoe. And in eighth grade, uh, Nike came out with a new shoe from Penny Hardaway called uh, the Foam Posit, the Nike Penny Foam Posit shoe. And man, I mean, first of all, just look at it. That is a beautiful shoe. And it looked so different than anything else on the court at, at that time. I was just like, I was enraptured with this thing. I remember talking to my parents and trying to like persuade them that they should get this. And this, this thing was expensive. It would be expensive now. It was really expensive then. And eventually my parents, uh, God bless them, they, they decided to buy me the shoe. And I have, I have been a Nike fan ever since. Like, I, I, I love these shoes at a young age, and I have worn, when it, when it comes to athletic shoes, almost exclusively Nikes ever since, even when Nikes weren't always the best, uh, the best fit for my particular need, just because I have this brand loyalty thing that, honestly, makes no sense whatsoever. Nike doesn't actually care about me at all, I just, but I got hooked early, right? And, and so it happens. So, uh, and then uh, I was looking for a razor when I was like, you know, 13, 14 years old, and uh, Gillette Hall had all these advertisements with these uh, pretty ladies and these manly men and, you know, f- feeling the face and, and how, oh, how smooth it was. And I just remember these being in magazines uh, that I was reading at the time and these being on television all the time. And so I started using Gillette razors when I was in middle school. And guess what I still use today? Yep, Gillette razors. Uh, I've, I, I tried to use a safety razor for a while. That experiment uh, kind of petered out and I, I'm, I'm back to them, right? So... So, like, they got me early, and they kept me. Um, oh, music players, right? So I had a Memorex player at one point uh, in college. It was terrible. Like, you had to preload it with, you know, it could take, I think, hold it to about 200 songs. And if you wanted to listen to track number 198, you had to press the forward button 198 times. But around that time, I was in the market for a new MP3 player, a new music player. And what I discovered was uh, this little beauty uh, made by Apple. And it was the, the U2 branded iPod special edition. I mean, man, I asked for this for my college graduation gift. And I loved the way it worked so much. I was, you know, I was probably 21 years old at the time. I loved the way it worked so much that I still to this day, almost all of my computing is Apple products. This kind of was, it was an entrance for me. And, and then I, I just fell in love with it and, and kept using it. Similarly, I remember a big basketball fan, right? Like uh, Tim Duncan and David Robinson were doing advertisements for Edge Shave Gel when I was in middle school and high school. And so I started using Edge Shave Gel because Tim Duncan used Edge Shave Gel. And then guess what shave gel I use today? That's right. Uh, Jack Black, because Edge Shave Gel was a horrible product and no one should ever use it. And if you do, I'm so sorry. And please, let's talk next time I'm in town. Okay, so, so you can see that when you are young, right, you are susceptible to advertising and to ways of thinking. And the older that you get, the more set in your ways you become. And it's not because, you know, you think of yourself 
as more closed-minded, it's that you've done some exploring, you've kind of figured some stuff out for yourself, and frankly, it's a lot of work to shift the way that you think. This is how we, individually, become set in certain patterns of thinking, so that when we talk about ways that Christians can move and live and have our being in God in a different way than we've heard before, it it automatically seems a little suspicious to us if we've not heard that before, thought that way before, acted that out. So I just want to say, if you've been hanging out these last several weeks, maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for a while, and some of this has felt like, wow, I've I've not thought about it that way, I haven't heard about it that way, Um, I haven't practiced it that way, I just want to say thank you for hanging in there. A number of you have emailed me or caught me in the lobby after a service, and we've had some great conversations. I really appreciate it. It. And if you're, if you're younger or you're newer to faith and you're still figuring some things out, and the way we've talked about following after Jesus over the last several weeks has, has felt uh, more beautiful to you or more, more compelling to you, then I just want to encourage you to keep hanging in there and keep spending time with Jesus, learning from Jesus, how to be like Jesus. That is what we try to do here every single week. But, but if we can get into a rut individually, you can imagine how a culture especially a culture that's been around for a while or has been heading in one particular direction for a really long time, you can see how a culture could get in a rut as well. So for followers of Jesus who believe that Jesus came to free us from some really challenging things, to to free us from our, our sin, to free us from our love of money and power and sex as the things that drive us, like the question can become like if we want to be helpful to the people around us, How can we change culture? How can we change culture? If we believe that the culture that Jesus has brought, right, when he flipped all of our understanding upside down, our worldviews, our our heroes, our artifacts, our rituals, like if if we believe that Jesus flipped all of that upside down, how do we go about helping other people to change the culture as well? Well, Andy Crouch in his book, Culture Making, Uh, says that there are basically four ways that over time, uh, four major ways that Christians have tried to change culture. And frankly, none of them have worked. So what I'm going to share with you over the next couple of minutes, like none of these are the answer. They all have major downsides. One of the ways he said we've tried to change culture essentially is to condemn it. To condemn, like the church over the years has tried to condemn culture when culture hasn't lined up with the church's expectation or belief about how culture should operate. Now, some of you who grew up in a more religious background or environment uh, remember this firsthand. Uh, I I was pastoring at a church in Pennsylvania for a while. This is in Amish country. And there were, you know, a a lot of Amish, Mennonite, uh, Anabaptist, Brethren in Christ type denominations in that area. And I heard numbers of stories from people who were older about how when they were growing up in the 40s, 50s, 60s, like, The official doctrine of their church that they attended, was was more Anabaptist-style churches, was that we just, we do not watch television. That is letting, right, worldly things into our house, and that we just do not watch it. And so they would come to church, and they would hear sermons talking about the evils of television, the evils of media, and then they would go home, and they would watch their TV. And then if the pastor ever came over, a lot of times they would take their TV, and they would put it into a closet so that the, the, the pastor never knew, right? So sometimes we just, we condemn culture. We say that, well, it's, it's not good, it's, it's wrong, and we, we can't have any part of it. So we don't actually necessarily have something that's more compelling. We don't necessarily have something that's more helpful. We just, we just straight out condemn what's in front of us. And truthfully, this has never worked. I remember growing up, I grew up in a Southern Baptist context, right? So I, I did not grow up in an irreligious environment. I grew up in a religious one. And I remember in the church that I grew up in, at least, in the 1990s, uh, there was, for a lot of different reasons that we won't get into, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, the whole denomination, 16 million people, decided that they were going to boycott Disney. And uh, Disney did not end up, uh, from what I could tell, with, with any harmful financial effects from this boycott. Rather, lots of Baptists just pretended to boycott and went anyway or bought the movies anyway or went to the theater anyway. And, um, and, and then it made national news and lots of other people knew about Disney things that wouldn't have known about it before. Like the boycott just did not work. The condemning of the culture, right? Even from a national platform of the largest denomination in the entire country, it did not have the desired effect. It didn't, condemning culture did not change culture. And what we find over hundreds and hundreds of years now of history is that condemning culture doesn't change culture. 
The second way that we can interact with culture is to critique it. When we're trying to change it, we can try to critique it. And Christians have certainly tried to critique culture over the years. This is a little more passive than condemning. Um, it's, it's really just uh, approaching culture and, and talking about what's good and what's bad about it, right? Think of a, a movie reviewer. Think of a, one like, a classic one would be like Roger Ebert, right? Siskel and Ebert was a show that was on a number of years ago on TV where they would, they would review movies every week and they would give it either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And now Netflix has adopted that entire set of language, right, for all the movies. You can say thumbs up or thumbs down to anything that you watch. This is critiquing it, saying this is what I liked about it, this is what I didn't like about it. And so that's engaging it. It's not necessarily condemning it outright. You say some things about it are good and some things about it are bad. And it's fine to critique culture. Just like it's fine, by the way, to say that there are parts of culture that we don't want a part of, that we don't think are good or that we don't think are healthy. It's fine to say that that's not good, to, to, to condemn parts of it. It's fine to critique parts of it. But here's the thing about critiquing culture. Critiquing culture doesn't change culture. It doesn't change it. It may be helpful for us as a thought experiment. It may help us determine what parts of culture are helpful or unhelpful, but it doesn't actually change culture. Another way to uh, engage with culture, to possibly change it, is to just to copy it, to copy culture. In fact, when I was, uh, when I was in high school, there was a major movement within, uh, you know, uh, Christian, lots of Christian churches in the United States. So this is like the 1990s and this is the early 2000s that uh, rather than, you know, for a long time, uh, a large, lots of churches in the United States condemned rock and roll music. And they thought that rock and roll was from the devil or that drums were from the devil. There was a lot of devil talk when I was growing up, right? The, the, the church lady bit on SNL. Uh, like it was, everything that was bad was, was from the devil. It was from Satan, right? That was kind of the, the thinking back in the 80s and 90s amongst a lot of churches in the 2000s. And so for, for a while, it was just like, oh, we'll just condemn it. But then what happened in the late 90s, early 2000s was... Lots of uh, Christian musicians decided to, instead of uh, to condemn or to critique culture, they would copy it. And so when I was, when I was a kid uh, in my little Christian youth group, if there was a secular artist, a, a band that was well-known, was getting a lot of radio play, then there was a Christian version of that that we could listen to that we thought was better, right? It's the same kind of music, has a similar vibe. So don't listen to Metallica, listen to Petra. And don't listen to uh, Whitney Houston, listen to Amy Grant. There was a, there was a Christian version of all of these different uh, secular mu musicians. And that definitely helped keep us in a little bit of a bubble, right? Definitely helped, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, saran wrap us a little bit away from uh, the dangerous secular culture. But it didn't change culture. Copying culture didn't change culture, and copying culture can't change culture. Uh, finally, and this is something I think has been more popular over the last several years, is just the idea that we just consume culture. We just consume it. So instead of condemning it or critiquing it or copying it, we just kind of give up and say, like, okay, culture is what culture is. And so all we'll do is we'll, we'll buy those albums We'll, we'll, we'll go see those, those movies. We'll just kind of participate and consume. But consuming doesn't change culture either. And, and see, as followers of Jesus, we believe that the message of Jesus was that there, there is a sickness in every culture right now. There's a sickness with, within every human heart. And the way, the way that we can see sunlight, Jesus could see the darkness of the human heart. Over and over again, he sat with people and talked with people and conversed with people whose, whose lives were broken and messed up. Their, their, their hearts were dark. There were, there were parts of it that they were ashamed of or that they, they didn't know how to deal with. And over and over, he sat with them and gave them an alternative way forward. He invited them to come to him. To, to turn things around, the, the biblical word for it is to repent, to stop going the way you're going, and to go a different way instead. Which means if we're following Jesus and we believe Jesus, then one of the beliefs that we ought to hold dear is that we can't get everything we need from the culture as it exists right now. And, and that doesn't mean that all of culture is terrible and it doesn't mean that we have to run and hide from it because we're so terrified of it. But, but the church... Is supposed to exist as an alternate society within society 
but also throughout society. <laughs> so we exist as an altered society within it, but we influence throughout it. That's, that's the way that the church is supposed to exist. And, and the only way that we can then like, bring this new message of hope and restoration, restoration and change and transformation is to change the culture a bit around us, is to be culture makers. See, the only way to change culture is to create culture. You can't just critique it, you can't just copy it, you can't just condemn it, you can't just consume it. Like the only way to actually change culture is to create culture. It's the only way forward. And, and specifically, the way to create culture is with one of the things we talked about in week one, and that is with artifacts. The way to create culture is with artifacts. In other words, like there are actual cultural goods that will have to be made and put into the world and consumed as alternatives to what's currently being consumed in order to shift and change culture. Now, listen, let me be really clear on this. We talk sometimes, all of our, almost every church you walk into, we'll talk a lot about wanting to change the world, and that's true. That is true. We want to change the world. But there are different scales for that, right? It's very rare that a product or a film or a religious belief will change the whole world at, at one time, like, like literally every single person. But what starts to happen is you can change parts of the world, which this, then change other parts of the world, and there can be this domino effect. So when we're creating culture, what we're talking about is really having an impact right where we are. There's an earthiness to this. Like, it's, it, it's a here thing. So when we're talking about changing culture, it's not in my mind that, like, our church is going to change the entire United States or the entire world this Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. It's not that kind of thing. It's saying, like, actually each one of us have a part to play in creating culture and therefore creating artifacts. Now, week one we talked about this. I'll be very brief here then in recapping it. An artifact is either an, an idea or physical object that shows some of the values of the culture. So for instance, we talked about the highway system in the United States is actually an artifact of our worldview. That one of the things that really matters to us here is being able to travel places quickly, to get from place to place fast. That's why we have a car culture. Almost everyone in the US, right, who, who has the means has a car, uh, except those who live in may, maybe a few major cities with, with really, really good public transportation. And that, that being able to travel and get around and, and having the freedom, right, it's very individualistic as well, having the freedom to do that whenever I want it, that's, that's of important value to us, and the highway system is an artifact of that value. So what are the artifacts that Christians can create to create culture? Because again, if we want to change it, if we believe that Jesus was right, if we believe that Jesus was right, that, that our hope should not be in what we have today, but in a new future that he is creating for us, then we need to consider changing culture. Now, uh, a lot of times we understand in churches that the things that the human heart tends to long for, the things that can both bring us great satisfaction and also great distress, tend to be sex, money, and power. Um, the way that the New Testament talks about this is uh, uh, the, the lust of the, the eyes, uh, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, like sex, money, and power. Now, you, you have probably, uh, it, if you've been in a church for very long, heard some messages on sex and the goods and the, and, and the possible lows of that, depending on how it's managed. You've probably heard some messages on money, about how it can be great and how, like, if you are generous and it cultivates a spirit of generosity, and also how it can be a downfall if it becomes an idol or all-consuming for you. But truthfully, we don't talk much in churches about power. Now, we have in this particular series, but it's not something that we touch on a ton. But we have to realize that to make culture, there is a cultural power we have to have in order to create artifacts but it looks different than the way we normally think about power. We normally think about power, in the U.S. especially, we think about, right, usually political power or uh, CEO-style power. Like, I, I have all this power at my disposal, and I can just use it, and no one can stop me. But that's not the way that Jesus thought about power. And in fact, the way that he thought about power, as we looked at a few weeks ago, is very different. So this passage has come up for us a few times in this series. But Matthew 20, uh, verses 25 and 26, Jesus says this. Jesus called his disciples together, and he said to them, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. 
but among you it will be different. Look, this is the way that the kingdom of the world goes forward. People have power, they flaunt it over the ones who they have power over. And he says, but my kingdom's going to be different. It's not the way it's going to go forward. Whoever wants to be leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of God came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. What Jesus is saying is that kingdom power, right, the the power that you have to create culture is not the same as what the world around you will use. Your kingdom power instead is going to come primarily through service and through stewardship. It's going to come through service and through stewardship. And so the hope then, right, is that if, if you're a follower of Jesus, that you will be willing to lay your life down for others, that you will be willing to serve others and put their needs ahead of you, and that you will be a good steward of whatever it is that God has given you. That as God um, allows you to steward things in his service, that you are able to then change the culture around you. So how did the early church do this? What did that look like? I'm so glad that you asked, because in the book of Acts, we see like this early church, and the way that they created community was the artifact, the cultural good, that ended up changing the world around them. In Acts chapter 2, Starting with verse number 42, we read this. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. This was a radical community. Uh, In fact, let's go and finish this passage so we can talk just about how radical it was. They sold their property, verse 45, and their possessions, and they shared the money with those in need. And they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Uh, There's a sociologist named Rodney Stark who wrote an entire book about how it is that the early church grew. And his big finding, as he studied and studied this, uh, and, and I believe proved it, is that it was this community, this radical community of care and love that started in the first century. This shift of culture for people that ended up drawing people in to the presence of God. Imagine this. You hear that this group of people is meeting and you know about them, like you're, you're a Gentile, you're not a part of a, really any religious sect particularly. You sometimes go and pay your homage to the emperor or to the, the gods of the empire, but that, that, it's not a really big part of your life. And then someone invites you to come to this meal, and you come and you see these Christians, these followers of Jesus, and you, you don't even have the Jewish background to fully understand everything that they're saying that Jesus is. So, so you're just kind of watching what they do, and here's what you see them doing. You see the wealthier Christians eating with the poorer Christians. You see that every person's need is taken care of by the community. You see that they are meeting regularly, daily, with one another to fellowship with each other, to break bread with each other, to experience life with each other, and to talk about this new way of living and existing and being in the world. I mean, this, this is a big deal. You've, you've never seen anything like this anywhere else. And the fact that they are behaving in this way, like, it is compelling to you. It is interesting to you. And so you come back again, and then you come back again, and you start to make friends with some of these people, and their way of life continues to be compelling. And you start to realize, like, no, they don't have it all together. Yeah, there's still people who make mistakes, but, man, they believe that the world could be a different, a better, a more hopeful, a more peace-filled place. And it is. What Stark shows us in his work is that this is exactly how the early church grew. And this, this, this irresistible understanding of Jesus was what saw hundreds and then thousands and then exponential growth after that happen all across the empire. So that by the time you get to the 4th, the 5th century, Christianity has gone from this like sect that was off to the side to, to now being the official religion of Rome. And we talked a few weeks ago about how that was good in some ways and majorly problematic in others, that some of the message of Jesus got lost because of that. But the way that they changed the culture was to create culture. This new way of living life in the way of Jesus ended up shifting the culture all around them over decades and then hundreds 
and now thousands of years. Like this way of caring for one another and thinking about the dignity of every single person. Understanding that Jesus died for all and therefore every person has infinite worth. That, that, that was a totally new concept in Rome in the first century. You were seen in your, as your, your social strata, as your caste, as your, as your particular place within the hierarchy of Rome. And then these Christians come along and rich and poor together, they start creating culture with one another. And it's not just the rich pulling the poor up. It, it, is, it is them working together and communing together that creates this new artifact. And the artifact that they create is community. It's a totally different way of seeing the world that ends up being incredibly compelling. How do we change culture? Theologian Stanley Howard Wass says it like this. The church doesn't have a social strategy. The church is a social strategy. The church doesn't have a social strategy. The church is a social strategy that we, we are to live as an alternate society embedded within and influencing without the society in which we find ourselves. That's what the first church did. And in doing so, it helped everyone see the world differently. And the culture shifted with it. A couple of weeks ago, I was taking my boys to school, and I was going to drop them off. And usually we, we, we talk to each other in the car, and we update, and you know, we're all groggy in the morning. And so someone will say, can we play a song? And actually, uh, on, fr- on Fridays, uh, we play this uh, horrible song that came out a number of years ago by an artist called Rebecca Black, and even she has disowned it at this point, called Friday. It's just Friday, Friday, gotta get down on Friday. It is not a good song. We all laugh because of how bad it is, but every single Friday when we get in the car, one of us will say, guess what day it is, guess what day it is. And then we play that song and we listen to it and we laugh. So it's a, it's a Friday and I'm taking the boys to school and we've listened to the song and it's over now. And we're about to pull into the parking lot of their elementary school. And Jack is talking to William, but William's not responding. And so Jack finally looks in the back seat and he says, Will, what in the world are you doing? And Will is just like, his, his, his face is pressed to the window. And he looks at Jack and he says, quiet, Jack. I'm just enjoying the world. And so what does Jack do? <laughs> Instead of bugging him again and trying to get his attention, Jack puts his face to the window. And for just a few minutes, right before they get out, both of them are just sitting there. One in the front seat, one in the back seat, and they're just enjoying the world. See, sometimes when we see somebody doing something that we find compelling, it makes us want to jump in as well. That's what the early church did. They lived in a compelling way, and then other people wanted to jump in as well. That's what we should do. We should live in compelling ways. Christians can shape culture by creating culture, right? It's not the condemning. It's not the critiquing. It's, it's not the copying. It's not the consuming. All of that may have its place, but none of that creates culture. Or none of that changes culture. The only way to change culture is to create culture. And what does that look like? It looks like my friends, Doug and Shahab, meeting together on a regular basis to determine how best to raise their young, soon-to-be teenage sons in order to follow after Jesus. They're creating this little community together. And together, they're going to try to make their sons' lives better and their sons better at life. That's their hope. It looks like that. It looks like our rooted groups here who are going out into the community to serve and to say, like, one of the things that we believe Jesus calls the church to do is to be a force for good in the world, and we're going to go do that and demonstrate that and participate in that. It looks, it looks like my friend David, who, who left Texas with his family to go to Pennsylvania in order to minister in a place that he'd really never spent any time in before, and to gather with other people who were far from God, and to try to create something new 
in the way of Jesus there that's community oriented. It looks, it looks like my friend Stephen, who decided that, that his deep hunger, his deep longing for the world, like, like what enthousi- makes him enthusiastic, what excites him, could meet a need at his place of employment. And so what he started to do, like he's, he, in, in, his, in his free time, he studies tons of leadership books. Like he, he just really loves doing that. So what he started doing at his place of employment is he started taking a number of people who work with him, alongside of him, underneath him, even above him, younger people. And he started getting together and having lunches with them and teaching them some leadership principles. And they would read books together. He basically started a leadership book club. And they read books together and learn how to lead better and how to lead in a more servant-like way. And there are people who are followers of Jesus who find that really helpful. And there are people who aren't sure what they think about faith yet who find that really helpful, but there's something compelling about Stephen's approach to servant leadership, which he copied from Jesus. It's starting to build a community there. And it's starting to build a culture there. It looks like a few people from Inland Hills Church a number of years ago that decided they needed to provide food for those in this area who didn't have means to get it. And they started a ministry called God's Pantry that feeds now hundreds and hundreds of families every single month. It started with just a few. Now, look, sometimes when we jump into a, a culture-making project, it, it doesn't succeed. It fails. But that's okay. What's important is that whether we are creating new culture, new artifacts, new ways of existing around Jesus in our family unit, or with some friends, or in a business, or in a nonprofit. Well, like there is a way that Jesus has called each of us to live and move in the world. And we can't change culture if we don't create culture. We have to replace what other people are pining for and longing for and chasing down, chasing after with something that's even more compelling. And I believe that that is what God has called the church to do in the 21st century in the U.S. and far beyond in every place. We are called to shape culture by creating it. Now look, if you're a follower of Jesus, I just want you to know that you have an incredibly important role to play in influencing those around you in the way that you create culture. And, and I want you to know that as we've walked through this series, one of the things I've been praying for is that you would, you would get some clarity over how it is that you can be helpful to the people who are closest to you and the people you work with and family members and friends. Like because, because each of us have this calling, I believe, in our lives in order to help shape the people around you. The future is waiting for those of us with the courage to step into it and create it. And God has called you to be a a sharer of this hope and this new way of life that he has for each and every one of us. We can't change the culture without creating it. And my hope is that we start to get a vision for the servant leadership of Jesus, for the power underway of love and the cross, for this Christ who best showed his love for us by laying his life down for his executioners. And that we will stop trying to play power games the way that the world invites us to play and instead to live counter to the world and counter to some of maybe the religious baggage that we grew up with, to follow after Jesus with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our soul, all of our strength, And in doing so, to change the culture around us by creating something new in his name. Heavenly Father, I thank you for our time together today. And Lord, I thank you for the very challenging last several weeks we've had as we've walked through the New Testament. And we've just seen that like sometimes the way of Jesus is just really counter to the way that we're living right now. And God, we just recognize that there are times when when each of us is guilty of making something uh, that's good into an ultimate thing and displacing it, this, this idea of idolatry, of, of, of making a good thing an ultimate thing, Lord. And I just pray, God, that as we pursue the way of Jesus, that you would point out to us in our hearts, in our minds, every place that we are putting something good into an ultimate spot, and that we would instead brush that aside and place you there. God, help us to follow after the teachings of Jesus. Help us, Lord. To, to change the culture around us for the better, for this more, more hopeful way of Christ by creating culture that's compelling. And would you lay on the hearts of each and every one of us how it is that we might, within our sphere of influence, create compelling culture in Jesus' name. It's in that very name that we ask these things. Amen.